Ten Province is a province-wide program that started in 2017. It aims to increase literacy and create a reading culture by providing opportunities for residents to become more socially engaged in their community through a shared story. One Book, One Province encourages Saskatchewan's social, economic, and cultural development while supporting libraries and collaboration. And as I mentioned earlier, the One Book, One Province program is an initiative of the Saskatchewan Library Association. Uh, to begin uh, tonight, or to continue tonight, I should say, uh, we have Kevin Wessequite. Kevin Wessequite is a spoken word poet and visual artist from Piaplat First Nation and currently lives in Saskatoon. He is the Indigenous Arts and Culture Leader at SkyUp. He is also the founder of the Indigenous Poets Society. The Indigenous Poets Society has their first anthology being published this September or October. And uh, Kevin wanted me to also mention that there is a fresh poetry slam at Station 20 West tomorrow night uh, and every last Thursday of the month. And with that, Kevin Westerberg. you all about one of the seven grandfather teachings and this teaching we call humility humility is one of those lessons I learned right from the very start in life you see I fell in love with art and expression I love teaching art to little kids I love teaching art to little kids so much that I found out that two of these little kids hadn't eaten for yet but two days but water and crackers so I took it upon myself to paint my face like a clown and I marched up and down the 20th Street Corps from the Viney Memorial all day long fundraising just so, so some kids could eat. And at one point I wish someone would have done that for me. And you see I learned about humility right from the very start. You see I was diagnosed as a dyslexic learner. That means that everything that I'd read or written was backwards. And I even remember writing my first Dear Santa Claus letter. And I think it went something like this. It went, Dear Satan, all I want for Christmas is a real evil God. Because a real live dog probably would have made my child get so much better. And people used to look at me funny like all the time. And I missed out on a lot of social interactions during my elementary years. Like recess, lunchtime, or after school, because you see, I was a special education student. I had to read and write everything three times in a row before I could get it. I had to read and write everything three times in a row before I could get it. I had to read and write everything three times in a row before I could get it. And some of these memories that I wish I didn't have, like that time when I was about six or seven years old when me and a group of friends had did a B and E. You see, I was never up to no good. I was just doing my own rendition of Robin Hood. I was just trying to do my best to feed myself. While my friends were focused on the wealth and the shelves, I was focused on food. You see. I went to a small high school near downtown Saskatoon so I could get the attention that I deserved. I played intramural basketball at lunchtime to take me off the lonely stairwells or my nose half buried in pages of poetry. I worked really hard. I wore hand-me-down clothing until I knew I could finally provide for myself and I worked really hard. And on my quest to university, I was working one job in construction, and finally at university I was working one job in a molecular genetics laboratory until one day poetry found me. Now you see I find myself surrounded by many friends and I continue to make new and exciting friends each and every day, and I even find myself 
the founder of a group called the Indigenous Poets Society. And I think I'm going to continue to do as so because this is my humility. to teach children at um, a local elementary school. This was dedicated to them shortly after I wrote this about 10 years ago. This is going out to St. Francis Elementary School nearing a 150% capacity. I just hope that they have room. You see students, your words are powerful and my words have been said. Your words are dancing to the new notes in my head. My words are like trees of autumn days, like leaves that leave you in so many different ways, while your words are trickling out like a spring runoff. Your words are bringing new meaning in life, while my words have been sustaining me all of these long winter nights. Your words are ushering in a summertime heat and are vibrant and new, while mine sit still, reflecting the cold days of gray years. I imagine your future in open land and touched by man while I'm over here harvesting my own and I'm trying my best to understand. You see, I envision a day when we can all speak your two languages, the way of the Nehewak poet naturally living, naturally speaking, naturally sharing metaphors and similes on hand drums near urban street corners, a place where Nehewak own homes on side streets by Nehewak own businesses on main streets and Poetry is taught in native schools on native tongues. Because your future is bright and nature has always been known to change. Because we'd be all beyond prejudice and hate. Because we'd be too busy trying on our latest traditional trends and fashions all up and down the block from ribbon shirts to ribbon skirts. And I imagine a place where, where we could trade in protein bars for pemmican, where we could pick wild berries in our communities, where things like diabetes is on the decline thanks to the return of our medicine keepers and our original diets. A place where children can run out near dark in these parks free of gangs and crime. A place where young men can let out their long hair like warriors in the past, only now wearing suits and ties and beadwork is honored and valuable over gold and diamonds and where instead of we, us seeing elders begging for change or suffering from homelessness, we would house them in the best of places and if a child was to only speak their Nehiao tongue, they would be regarded as royalty on these prairies. And I'm referring to you young native poets. I am honored to have been your momentary teacher of poetry, and I'm glad to know that you could go on practicing your new poetry skills in two languages, as I only know this one. So let your spoken words fancy dance swift to my heartbeat. Let your spoken words lead you out into that open wild, and don't be afraid and don't look back, young native poets, because this is where I make my stand. Okay. And I often write about my, my grandparents because they took me in from time to time. Uh, so I like to write poetry for them sometimes. Uh, my grandmother is still alive. Um, and I'll probably be going to visit her very soon. I practice, I practice my dark magic in secret far off places as a child. I whispered out to these winds my chants and they echoed over these prairie fires. I yelped at dawn, inviting in the stars with the coyotes fearlessly. After my chores, of course, you see I had a childhood right with watering the horses, cleaning the yard, feeding the chickens, sharpening the axes, mending the fences, and clearing the brush. Because the Musum, my grandfather, appreciated, appreciated his clear prairie views tirelessly. I've sometimes been called a dog upon the reservation with no business digging around Nimosum's yard. His purebred dogs had cool sounding names like Rocket, Pepper, or Lucky. Well, my name was always just Kevin. 
pasture to yard, sniffing, sniffing and barking, shamelessly chasing horses and dodging kicks and always coming back with crooked shaped sticks that look like the animals of the land or even the rifles on Nemoshim's walls. And these actions are what reaffirm my childhood shapeshifter ways, allowing me to be sneaky and clever. Afternoon bingos left an open house and I snuck in and I creeped through the old photo albums as steady as a mouse in awe of the old days gone by, guessing of Mimushum's adventures, sitting in his favorite chair by the window, playing checkers with the clouds and wishing the warmth of the sun was my grandfather's hugs. These memories of a shapeshifter child until I finally got brave with my shapeshifter ways. So I turned into a black fly perched up upon the wall, waiting for Kukum to start cooking, waiting for a chance to steal and teasing and buzzing on by. I'm just so majestic in my wings. Ooh, fresh cinnamon apple pies, pies. <clears throat> sturdy tables, and I'm so agile, I'm so able, hovering, of, hovering above cooking pots, oh, so tasteful, potatoes dancing about, carrots dancing so tastefully, it was always a surprise to me how she decidedly mixed it up perfectly with cows or chickens or pigs, yet gracefully switching it up again with the natural flavors of the land like duck or moose. Oh, how I was one lucky shapeshifter child, and not one single moment of boredom living in these old traditional ways, feeling genuine indigenous love, and even to this day, a proud wild child remains reminiscing of his shapeshifter ways. And I've been in this city for over 30 years now. And I love this city. I've tried to move away time and time again, but I've always come back. And I dedicate this one to Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan flowing swift, cool evening breeze, and I'm out here jogging westerly. Saskatchewan flowing swift, and with every stride I can hear nippy water calling to me with certainty, beautiful reflections catching my eyes from Every sigh, oh, the sunset, so seductive, so I stop running to catch my breath, and these views, simply breathtaking. Squatting down, I'm pondering just, maybe just a few more steps in these shallow depths. These stories of accidents reluctantly remain with me of how you've taken sons, sisters, and even a few of my friends. Respectfully, I lay my tobacco down, and sometimes, these lessons we learn are hard and difficult, and yonder bystanders sitting upon the rocks, oblivious and unaware. You see, we place these stones just as we place the many warning signs along the trails to your sides, like medicine wheels counting celestial bodies floating on by. And as children play, we constantly tell them how dangerous, but this kind of beauty only lulls us into walking, holding hands with our future in romantic ways, our entire lives spent near your north and south banks, always claiming these most wondrous spots to memory. And as we further out along your fringes, discovering more to muse upon, Dusting off of these rocks, we sometimes cast these long lost messages of the Nehewak people, the hunters of the Pasquawi Mustus, the prairie buffalo, thunderous herds smashing through effortlessly parting Saskatchewan from east to west as if we were all different, vastly cult different but vast cultures, yet don't we all carry the same heartbeat in our chest? We've uncovered camps and identified sacred places called Buffalo Pounds at one Iskewin, reminding us all to be at peace within ourselves. From the beginning, remember the Métis settlements, remember the round prairie as boys to fletch, the way of the arrow has always shown us the way home, and the temperance colony that turned to Saskatoon misinterpreted, misaskotoninik, 
Think of Wapahaska, Dakota Whitecap people for leadership and strength. Out past these beaver creeks and afforestation next works. We stand back in full admiration because water is life. Water is life, nurturing unique ecological sites like the Northeast Swale, holding together without fail like good, strong medicine. And as we continue to congregate near these river launches, celebrating, fully knowing that these waterways are her veins, weaving back and forth, reflecting the vibrance of heaven, and underneath it all, we learn in these humble yet continuous ways, from mothers to daughters, magical connections of moon cycles, from fathers to sons, always teaching to respect Saskatchewan, the fast flowing underneath. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was great. Uh, next, uh, Michelle Good. <laughs> Michelle Good is a Cree writer and member of the Red Pheasant Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. After working for Indigenous organizations for 25 years, she obtained a law degree and advocated for residential school survivors for over 14 years. Good earned a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at the University of British Columbia while still practicing law and managing her own law firm. Her poems, short stories, and essays have been published in magazines and anthologies across Canada, and her poetry was included, uh, included on two lists of the best Canadian poetry in 2016 and 2017. Five Little Indians, her first novel, won the HarperCollins UBC Best New Fiction Prize, the Amazon First Novel Award, the Governor General's Literary Award, and the Rapidton Kobo Emerging Writer Award. It was also long listed for the Scotia Bank Giller Prize and a finalist for the Writers Trust Award. And won Canada Reads last year. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, also coming up to the stage is Karen Schmann, who is a Red River Métis and a Saskatoon-based educator. She is the director of the Métis Culture and Heritage Department at Gabriel Dumont Institute. Um, as some of you may know, Lisa Bird Wilson was originally planning to be here to interview Michelle Good, uh, but was not able to make it, so Karen is taking her place, and uh, they are and uh, if uh, Lisa were here, are here on behalf of the Saskatchewan Aboriginal Writers Circle Incorporated. Um, so, ladies, uh, you can just turn on the mic with that switch and it'll come out of the speakers. And uh, I'll pass it on to these two. Good evening, everyone, and I want to thank Joe for the lovely introduction and Judy for the prayer, and Kevin for his fine, fine work there. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, I'm pinch hitting for Lisa Bird Wilson, as you heard, and uh, she was the uh, One Book, One Province uh, selection in 2019, and she's uh, also the executive director of the Gabriel Duan Institute and the president of Saucy. So I humbly uh, help her out tonight by pinch hitting, and I would like to honor uh, the questions that she took the thoughtful time to prepare to ask Michelle tonight. I might have done it differently myself, but I think I would like to honor Lisa's words, and so if you can bear with me, I'll be reading some of those questions. Uh, this book has won a lot of awards and a lot of acclaim, all well deserved. Congratulations again. And what has the, that attention done for raising awareness about the impact of residential schools on Indigenous people in this country? Can you hear me mm -hmm. without a mic? Okay. How much? What you say to me, I don't. I can't hear you if I suddenly sort of dip, which I do. 
as I prefer not to use a mic if I don't have to. Um, but first of all, I'd like to start to express my appreciation for being the, given the opportunity to have these kinds of conversations, both through you know the One Book, One Province program and the other things that, uh, that I've been involved in over the past uh, almost three years since the, the book came out. And I think the importance of that is that it's in conversation that we come to know each other between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and that we know each other's heart that way. And that is what is going to ultimately pave the way for meaningful and substantive reconciliation. So I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity, and I thank you for being here tonight. And uh, but in terms of the, <laughs> you know, the awards and the accolades and so on and so forth, of course, you know that's phenomenal, just amazing. <clears throat> and let me tell you, no one's been more surprised by it but, than me. Um, when I wrote the book, I fully expected it to be a niche book for a niche audience. Um, I really thought that people with already who were already interested in this subject would be the ones that picked it up. I certainly did not expect this. And while it's very satisfying personally, you know, it took me nine years to write this book, um, the importance of these awards are that it raises the profile of the book. More people pick up the book, more people read the book, more people enter this necessary conversation. And so Really, you know, there is that great personal satisfa satisfaction, but most importantly, it expands engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lisa's second question is, uh, this is an important book to look at the aftermath of the psychological impact that residential school survivors carry with them and how those experiences are pervasive throughout their lives. When I think about the enormity of these stories, of these lived realities, one thing that strikes me is the huge responsibility of the author in telling these stories. Can you comment on this? Nine years. <laughs> <laughs> in a word. <laughs> and Excuse you know, me, I didn't hear the beginning. Yeah, your voice is softer saying. than mine. Oh, okay. Why don't you just read it again with the mic? Might as well. Yeah. Thank you. Just read it again with the mic. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. This is an important book to look at the aftermath of the psychological impact that residential school survivors carry with them and how those experiences are pervasive throughout their lives. When I think about the enormity of these stories, of these lived realities, one thing that strikes me is the huge responsibility of the author in telling these stories. Can you comment on this? Nine years. <laughs> So, so she's probably wondering, what's she talking about? <laughs> I'll use this, it just might make things easier for folks. So um, that was the primary reason that it took so long. I mean, I was still practicing law and I was still running my little firm and you know all that stuff and doing the MFA. Um, but this is not a subject that you approach lightly. This is a subject uh, that has affected multiple generations of our people. Um, they say 150,000 children were subjected to these schools. I think it's more than that. And the reason that I think it's more than that is that the record keeping for these schools only started when the church and the government uh, established their relationship by, where, by way of when the government would fund the schools and the churches would administer them both in terms of you know day to day operations and in terms of um, you know the mandate to deconstruct little Indian kids and reconstruct them uh, in the ways in the image of white men. And um, I say it's more than that because those records, it's <laughs> you know it's almost funny, right? Um, what they were were invoices. When I was practicing law and representing survivors. Um, they would have to prove that they were at the school at a particular given time. So we would have to look back at these quarterly returns and look at, you know, were they there at this time, what school they were in, and so on. But that's what they were, is they were invoices. So, you know, if the government hadn't been funding these schools, there would have been no records at all. So, you know, I think the numbers are much higher than that. Um, because, you know, the first school that also uh, 
involved the government was in 1831, the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Ontario. And, um, you know, the, the government was involved in that one. And, but prior to that, there were schools that were run entirely by the churches without the government influence or the government participation. Certainly the government influence was there. Um, and so I think the number is much higher, much higher than 150,000. And as I was starting with this, you know, this subject is not something you embark on lightly because so many people could be injured if I did not tell these stories in just the right way. And so, you know, I did the first draft of the novel in the MFA program and then worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And in many ways, I felt often that more than being a creator of these stories, I was a scribe. I felt spiritual influence. I felt these characters came alive for me so quickly and so fully. And sometimes, and I won't name names, one of these characters, it would seem that she would speak to me. And, um, and she, I sound like I'm bonkers, don't I? <laughs> and, uh, she would speak to me and she would say things like, I wouldn't say that, young know, right? And, uh, you know, and, and it became interactive in that way. And, and I'm thankful for that as well. Um, but these are not stories you tell lightly. You, you know, and I said today, I did a, an event at the university today and I said, these were really my love letters to survivors. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to make my own comment at this point because I, I think uh, I, I felt your responsibility as I was uh, reading the book and one of the most powerful things I think you did was to um, personalize the characters so that they became very real people to us because it's always so easy to other and distance ourselves from any kind of tragedy or something that's going on with a group of people and then to see all of those people experiencing that as being very similar. The individuals that you uh, um, characterized in, in this book are very unique. They, they are different people who had a common experience but and each of them handled, coped, um, survived or perished or recovered from it in different ways and I think that is very powerful tool for our reader to uh, take away from this book. You know, that was, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because that was so important to me. Um, you know, I think it was about maybe three, four years ago in Canada Reads and one of the defenders characterized a book um, and it was a book based on an Indigenous theme by an Indigenous author and characterized it as trauma porn. And it was really devastating to that writer but it was also kind of true. Um, and there has been, as you say, uh, a trend to characterize survivors of colonial violence, at focusing almost entirely on the trauma that they experienced, as opposed to, as you say, characterizing these as people, making these people humans, fully fledged humans with all of the wants, the desires, the loves, the hates, the joys, the humor, the, the complete humanness of them. And I, I was dedicated to that when writing this. I did not want these kids to come off as caricatures. And, um, you know, so I put a lot of time into letting that take shape. Um, and I, I'm thankful that people are seeing that. Um, and receiving it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I even uh, had a little chuckle at the some of the subtle nuances that were really weren't part of the story, but they they uh, made me relate to the characters every time they went for Chinese food. <laughs> I said, "Yep, yep, those those, those are my peeps." <laughs> okay, uh, this is uh, Lisa's third question. I'm struck by the absolute abandonment of the characters as they left the residential school and it brings to mind the child welfare system and the way kids are cut loose at the magic age of 18. 
I appreciate how you depicted the sense of utter lostness and vulnerability as Lucy leaves the school and goes to Vancouver, where she has next to no connections. And yet, it is in Vancouver that Lucy is able to find belonging and community. I wonder if you can comment on that notion of urban indigenous community. Yeah. This was, um, you know, I was a 60 scoop kid. And uh, so that experience, like when you age out of foster care, um, I mean, prior to aging out of foster care, when I was 16, I went to my social worker and I said, I have to live alone or I'm going to die and it'll be your fault. <laughs> I was a strange child. Um, but I was able to negotiate that, where social services put me in this little tiny apartment and paid the rent directly to the landlord. And, and I lived alone from the time I was 16. And you know, it was a glorious place to me. It was a dump. <laughs> but to me, it was heavenly. It was just, oh, freedom. And uh, I went to school. You know, again, weird little kid, 16, living in your own apartment. What was I doing? Going to school and being introduced to, to Canlit, but I digress, which I'm really good at, and you'll, you'll see that as we progress tonight. But when you age out, you know, if you've got five cents in your pocket and a hole in your shoe, that's it. Too bad, that's it. And you just have to find your way or not. And that hasn't changed very much, you know, from then to now. And as you can see, I'm 30, right? You know, so it wasn't really all that long ago. Um, but, um, and so some of those experiences that I was able to uh, um, make the characters' experiences were my own experiences. You know, dealing with racism, trying to figure out how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you, you know, how do you find your way? And you know the kinds of uh, challenges that uh, that arise, especially if you're experiencing um, you know any kind of burden of psychological injury, which certainly every child that walked out of residential school carried. And so, you know, and the 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 brutal thing about this that has always struck me as being probably one of the most vile examples of colonial violence in the residential school system was how these kids couldn't go home, you know, um, even after they left the school, even if they physically and geographically were able to make it home, their place had been removed, their place of belonging, their sense of kinship and relationship had been torn asunder, if you will. And, you know, I really wanted that to be clear. And that's why I articulate that in Kenny's story and in Maisie's story, how they go home, but it's just not home anymore. And so, you know, we have these kids, um, you know, that try to go home, they don't fit in anymore, and, uh, and they start um, gravitating to urban centers. And in that, you begin to see the, uh, um, the creation of the Friendship Center Societies, which really arose in response to that, to these you know, vast numbers of kids finding themselves on city streets. Um, and so, yeah, that's um, you know, something that we're still seeing, the, the colonial violence in the child welfare system, which I often refer to as the bastard child of the residential schools. And, um, you know, the residential schools started to close in 1969. And, you know, people might think that that was, uh, you know, as a result of a recognition that this was really wrong-headed and not the correct approach. Um, but it wasn't. The reason that they started closing down, it's so ridiculous, right? but the reason they started closing down is because the people that were working in the schools wanted to be considered full-fledged federal employees. So they wanted to be on that salary scale with benefits and pensions and superannuation and vacations and you know blah blah blah. And the government decided this is too expensive. And so they started winding down the residential school system and at the same time the child welfare filled in that, uh, uh, that empty place as the schools stopped. And instead of 
the priest, accompanied by the RCMP and the Indian agent, it was the social worker that walked in and started apprehending children, taking children away. And I have this story. Um, it was in the 70s and I was working for the Union of BC Chiefs in Vancouver. It was uh, probably 1967, maybe? no, I'm not that old really. It was like 1977-ish around there. And there was a family in the Northeast, an Indigenous family in the Northeast of the province, and they, they uh, contacted the Union because their children had been apprehended. And they were apprehended from a family that was living traditionally on their trap line. And the rationale of the social worker for apprehending these children was because there was no food in the house. Okay. In actuality, there were rows and rows and rows of dried game meat hung from the rafters. And when the social worker was confronted with this, she said, I thought they were rags. Okay. Which is a demonstration of how these social workers and this whole child welfare machine is so completely unqualified to determine the sufficiency of an Indigenous family. And they're still doing it today. They're still doing it today, and we all know that. Um, anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, I didn't grow up in uh, severe poverty, but I always joke around that if we'd been walking down the street and somebody said, look at that poor family, we'd be looking around because we'd like to know what a poor family looks like. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't us, we were rich because we were loved and we felt like we belonged. Okay, Lisa's next question. I remember you saying in an earlier interview that the book started with Kennedy, Kenny and took off from there. Can you talk about the process of figuring out the five characters and how the book would ultimately work? Oi. <laughs> Again, nine years. No, um, the first character was Kenny. And Kenny came out of a... Um, Sorry. Yeah, okay. Kenny came out of a, a, an, um, an assignment, an exercise in the MFA program, and we were to write a paragraph, and I can't remember what our instructions were, but it was something about incorporate this, incorporate that, blah, blah, blah. And so I wrote this paragraph about Kenny being in the dorm at night and feeling so alone and so far away from his mother and crying for her. And um, and I knew as soon as I finished that paragraph, I knew, oh dear God, this poor kid can't carry the whole weight of this story. I'm going to need more characters because, you know, people respond to trauma in very individualized and unique ways um, that depend on, you know, how strong they are to begin with, how resilient they are to begin with. Um, and also, you know, everybody has different ways of responding. And so I needed to, to broaden the cast of characters, so to speak, so that I could represent both the young man's response, the young woman's response, how that continued to resonate through their lives, how some would succeed, would be able to resist, how some would fade and would lose um, in their struggle to find a place in the world. And so, um, you know, Clara, how many people have read the book? Oh, you guys are so awesome. <laughs> um, you know, Clara, uh, you know, starts as this, uh, well, not going back to her childhood, but after she left the school, this furious, furious person. And, um, but in this, the, the beginning of the book, she was one of the first of many drafts. She was a secondary character, but, she just kept growing and growing and growing. And it was the same thing with Lucy. Lucy started as a little girl in the school as a foil to Kenny. And, you know, so that I could express through Lucy how the kids looked so up to him as their hero because he wouldn't quit running away. He wouldn't quit trying to escape. And so, uh, yeah, so they sort of just wove their way into my consciousness that way. and. Uh, you know, and I just kind of let them grow as they would. Um, somebody asked me, just it's kind of related, uh, why I chose a braided narrative structure. And, uh, and there's a simple, very technical reason, and that's, you know, if I had 
told these stories as a straight chronology, the book covers over 40 years, okay? And, you know, it would have been, I'd be still writing it, right? At least it would be about 5,000 pages if I was just doing a straight chronological narrative of each of the lives of these characters. Um, but the other aspect of that was that braided narrative, I loved it always. I mean, Louise Erdrich and her braided narrative just just leaves me in fits of admiration. But it, I think the reason that I love it so much is because it's a far more circular way of telling a story, which in my view is much closer to the way Indigenous storytelling is. It's a far more circular thing. It's not, you know, linear. And uh, yeah, so that. Okay, Michelle, well, thank you for that. And uh, you can tell me if we already covered this or if there's more you'd like to say about it. Um, I'm thinking about the history of the residential schools and the connections to the child welfare system and how they both operate and operated as a means to erase Indigenous people, to erase our indi indigeneity. And in this book, Lucy has her baby and the welfare lady comes to challenge her fitness as a mother based on nothing more than Lucy's indigeneity. I'm wondering if you could comment on the connection between these two instruments of colonial oppression and how they are connected. Um, yeah, um, you know, there are still people in the world that think about, oops, I think I've never done this before. There are still people in the world that think that the residential school uh, legacy, which I refer to as an implement in the colonial toolkit, was a well-intentioned thing. And I, this is why I appreciate these opportunities, because I can, you know, I can offer information um, that puts the lie to that. Um, I think it was in the year 2000, I was contemplating doing a Master's of Law and then I decided, nah, why would I want to do that? Um, you know, I don't want to teach law. I don't want to do any of that stuff, right? I mean, law, right? So, um, but uh, I did all of the research for the thesis that I intended to write, which was about residential schools. And uh, back then, that was when you had to go to the dusty archives. You had to go to the libraries. You had to, you had to actually physically you know, in your white gloves, go through the dusty documents and so on. And uh, now it's much easier, much, much easier. Some of these things I'm going to share with you, you can get them online like in 10 minutes, and, uh, and I challenge you to do so. Um, but again, there are these people who uh, think that it was a well-intentioned uh, thing. It wasn't. And it was, as I say, an implement in the colonial toolkit. And when we think about colonialism, we often get wrapped up in its derivatives, in the, in the study of its derivatives, like neocolonialism, settler colonialism, post-colonialism, and so on. And so I like to go back to the basic definition of what colonialism is. I've taken a long way to answer the question. So um, that definition is, colonialism is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. That's it. That's all. And so one of the objectives of colonialism, obviously, was to wipe us out. Okay, was to get, up off, get us off the land, get settlers onto the land, so the resources could be extracted, exploited, and could enrich the European nations that were financing the colonial venture. And part of that was the aim to destroy the foundations of Indigenous community and Indigenous nations. Um, and <clears throat> um, one of those things was, you know, to destroy our economy. And in particular for, for prairie people, the bison and the buffalo were so critical to that economy. It was our food, clothing, and shelter. And uh, in the 1870s, the American government was encouraging the slaughter of buffalo as a strategy <clears throat> to conquer um, the American Plains Indians. And of course, 
it was mirrored uh, around the same time in Canada. And uh, General Sheridan, who was the head of the Department of the Interior, which was also the War Department, um, said this, let them kill, skin, and sell until the buffalo are exterminated. Then your prairies can be covered with speckled cattle and the festive cowboy. I don't know what a festive cowboy is, right? but you know, I, I, you know, we can probably imagine. <clears throat> and in Canada, you know, we all know that Regina used to be known as pile of bones, right? And of course, those were buffalo and bison bones. And uh, approximately four million buffalo were exterminated on the Canadian plains. Um, and Sir John A. Macdonald defined this as a policy of submission based on a policy of starvation. Um, in treaty making, there are two aspects to it. One is, of course, to enter into the treaty agreement. But the second part of it is to choose a reserve. And um, Mistahi Masqua, my relation, Big Bear, he refused. He ultimately, when his community, his band, if you will, was starving to death, after spending a hard winter in the Cypress Hills, um, he took treaty at Fort Walsh, but he refused to choose a reserve. And this is how, I'm really digressing, this is how the incident at Frog Lake was ignited, um, was because the Indian agent would refuse repeatedly to give them the rations that they were entitled to through treaty, and they were starving. Um, to complicate matters, the um, the remaining herds were infected with brucellosis, so they were uh, diseased. And because they were starving, people would eat these diseased buffalo. And of course, that just complicated the situation much more. Um, so it's against that backdrop. Okay, all of that was happening before the residential schools were well established and certainly before they were made mandatory. And so we were suffering the impacts of that colonial violence and then they came for the children. Um, and quite early on there was a, a drive uh, to establish these schools and um, in 1879 Nicholas Flood Davin, who was a father of Confederation, was sent to the US to study the Indian boarding school um, system there. And that's what the Canadian system was ultimately based on. And that's where the relationship between church and state was determined to be um, the best approach. So he came back after going to see the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, he came back um, just thoroughly excited with the notion of the contractual relationship between the church and, um, and the government, where the government would essentially be hands off, laying down the objectives and paying, and the church would administer, um, would administer that. And so the, um, the schools in the state were, were in the states were designed by a fellow named Richard Henry Pratt, who, uh, and their flagship school was Carlisle, uh, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And um, he, claimed to our father of confederation that he had discovered a new way to deal with the Indian problem by so-called education and assimilation and said that he found such boarding schools to be quite effective in deconstructing young Indian children. Those are his words, they're not my words. And so, you know, that was the whole point was to, to deconstruct these children um, and to replace their whole sense of self with that of uh, a non-Indigenous uh, epistemology, if you will. And so there was also, of course, I mean, this, the, the motives of the, of the government and the motives of the church were quite, they married well, right? They had similar objectives for different reasons. But there was a bishop, uh, Vital Grandin, uh, who was in the Northwest Territories, it was known then, it was in the Edmonton area. And he um, wrote a letter encouraging the development of this approach, the contractual relationship between church and state to Sir John A. Macdonald, who was 
the head of the Department of Indian Affairs at the time. And he said this in one of his letters. He said, we instill in them a pronounced distaste for the native life so that they will be humiliated when reminded of their origin. When they graduate from our institutions, the children have lost everything native except their, butt, their blood. Okay, so if anybody ever tries to tell you this was a great, you know, a great objective that just went terribly wrong, tell them no, no, it wasn't that at all. It was a direct attack on the integrity of our um, communities, our nations, our way of being. And so um, this leads me to talk about intergenerational trauma. And um, a lot of people see that in quite a linear way where they'll see, you know, what somebody went to a residential school and they come out of the school and they're deeply traumatized and they live their life thereafter because who would ever have a psychological intervention or a therapeutic intervention then? And, um, and they continue to respond to the world with trauma responses, even if it's not something, like just regular everyday events, they would respond with these trauma responses. And children learn so much of what children learn, they learn from what they observe. And so these children are watching their parents having these trauma responses and they're taking that in as, oh, that's how you relate to the world. You know, you relate to the world by, <gasps> right, you know, as your heartbeat goes through the roof and you're afraid for some reason you don't understand. But I see it in a different way. I see it in a more circular way. And I say that the first, first infliction of trauma was when that child was taken and it was on the grandfather, the grandmother, the auntie, the uncle, the parents, the community as a whole. Because not only was that child taken away, but the role of the grandparents, the role of the parents, the role of the aunties, the role of the community in raising that child up to take a special place and a trained place in that community was taken away. So it's far more circular than just that, you know, linear, oh yeah, you went, so it affected your kids. It, you know, and it fits, if you think about colonialism and its objective of, you know, just taking over and getting rid of us, okay, that fits so like hand in glove. Because that was the first unraveling of the social fabric of our community, taking away the teaching role of the family, the extended family, and the community. Um, and so, you know, and then child welfare takes over that role as well. Uh, carries on with that role of, of um, separating children from the people who can teach them how to be in their own place in the world, in their proper place in the world. So, long-winded, but yeah. Thanks, Michelle. That, uh, that context of background is re really important because I don't think, it, again, I mean, we're, we're being told over and over again by non-Indigenous Canadians that they were never taught this and that they didn't know about it. So now that you do know, it, the responsibility falls back on the people who don't know to, to find out. But it's also one, one of the reasons I can, uh, I, I get to agitated and I can't accept the word that the tre treaties were negotiated. You, you don't negotiate with people that um, with a gun at you've been impoverished and made starving so their only chance of survival is to agree what, to whatever's in that treaty. And so I, I, you know, every time I see that word negotiated, I think that's a version of the story, but it's not the, the true story of it. And this is the truth that has to come before reconciliation. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, this book has been received so well and has, you know, created such a, an opportunity for conversation that people are picking up. And I'm so thrilled by that. Um, but it also uh, made me put my second novel down. I'm not working on my second novel right now. And instead what I did was I wrote a collection of essays. Um, and it's called Truth Telling, Seven Conversations About Indigenous Life in Canada. And <clears throat> really what this little book is, is an invitation to engage in a conversation. But more importantly, it's debunking 
the myth of Canadian history. It's, you know, like this concept, oh, trees were negotiated. You know, oh, we provided all these things for Indigenous people. Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, so that's why I decided, because I really feel, you know, I feel quite imbued with hope um, that I get from the response of people to this book. I get hundreds of emails, I got two today, from readers that reach out to me um, about their response to the book. And some of them are like what you say, right? Where they say, I just didn't know, but now I'll never forget. That's an email someone sent to me. Another woman <coughs> sent me, uh, bless you, another woman sent me uh, an email from Montreal and she said, I have to admit to you that I've treated Indigenous people poorly all my life. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, I've done, mm, bite my tongue. And she said, um, you've changed me. This book changed me. And she said, thank you for making me a better person. And you know, it's like, oh my God. So there is that willingness. There is that willingness in the world. There will always be, you know, the boneheaded, racist, bastards, bigots. That's just a, an unfortunate reality. But the doors have opened and the truth is being exposed. And, you know, the Honorable uh, Murray Sinclair has said that without truth there can be no reconciliation. And that's true. Because how can you renegotiate, at the risk of using that terrible word, a relationship if the truth is not at the foundation of that relationship. And so so that's what I'm trying to do with the years that I've got left, is to um, expose as much as I can about what really happened, to encourage non-Indigenous Canadians to reconsider the myth of Canadian history and to try to experience that, to see that through the lens of the Indigenous experience, how we experienced it in, that, in those times. And not just long, long ago, but our modern history as well. And so, you know, so that's what I, that's what I search for. And that's, what I, that's really why I, I am thankful for these opportunities. Because it's these conversations, it's people bearing their hearts to each other and coming to, to see each other as, you know, brothers and sisters, regardless of whether we are Indigenous or non-Indigenous. It's only then when I can look at you or you or you and you and you at me and say, I know you, that we will feel a responsibility sufficient to make this right. And I believe we can. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I think Lisa picked up on the hope as well. Uh, this is her uh, question. This book is devastating in so many ways, and yet it is also hopeful. Lucy keeping her baby, her determination, there is so much hope in this and power. I'm pleased that the book ends with hope, and I'm sure that's intentional. Can you comment on the importance of hope when we are telling our stories? If you don't have hope, you don't have anything. If you don't have hope, you don't have the drive to get where you need to get to. And it was absolutely intentional. And uh, <laughs> I had a critique from somebody that said, you know, trying to tell me, oh, but, you know, that's just too pat, that's just too sugary sweet. And I thought, what are you telling me? You want me to kill my characters? Like, you want me to, you want me to make them like totally miserable people that have no faith or hope or belief? Well, screw that. Part of me, right? It's like, no. And, you know, because when we look at, like, who survives this history, right? I mean, our, my mother went through terrible brutalities. When she went to school, she didn't speak a word of English. She only spoke Cree, and she would be beaten up for it. I heard stories from survivors about having their tongues impaled with needles if they were caught speaking their languages. And yet here we are. In these events today, we hear people that are fluent in the language, and that's so critical because our entire epistemology as a people is in that language, is in our languages, and we did that. So why on earth would we not be hopeful? We just need to look at ourselves and say, we are amazing, we are capable, we are so brilliant, right? Um, so yeah, 
everything I write always embraces hope. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Um, this is her last question, but uh, to, we can keep going on whatever else you want to cover. Can you tell us about what you are working on next? <clears throat> well, this book is coming out May 30th, this one, um, the little collection of essays. And I'll, um, I'll say that, you know, they're not academic essays, they're personal essays. And woven into them is my own personal experiences, um, as well as, you know, my, my long involvement with the consideration of Canadian history and my, uh, my uh, desire for us to get rid of the myth of that. I'm also now um, working on a new novel that follows the life of my great-grandmother, who was um, Miss Dahi Musquez's niece. And she was at Frog Lake, and she was with the, his band when they were hounded into um, um, the, um, uh, through the Cypress Hills into Montana. And uh, she never saw a non-Indigenous person until she was we think what we can put together. She was probably in her late teens, maybe 20, by the time that, that she saw a non-Indigenous person. And um, she, as a character, she is an Indigenous woman that embraces the reality of both pre and post contact. And so in her story, you can so um, handily articulate pre-colonial life. I mean, sure, there would have been implements and trade goods and so on, but but not that relationship, that forced and oppressive relationship until later in her life. And then you get to see the impacts as well and the profound, profound violence that was imposed on Indigenous people and the impacts of that, not only on her, but in her relationship with my mother and her other grandchildren and how that impacted them in their lives. And so my deadline for that is uh, I have to have that finished by the end of next September. So it'll be out in the spring of 2025. So I'm working on that. And um, yeah, so this fall I will be turning off the phone and social media. And you won't see me for a good long time. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm actually really excited about that, uh, about that story. I think it's going to be a gooder. Thanks, Michelle. Are you ready for some audience interaction? Yeah. All right. If you would like to make a comment to Michelle or if you have a question for her, um, now's your chance. Um, if you can speak up. Uh, if everybody can't hear you, I'll do my best to repeat whatever it is you're, uh, you're saying. Or if you really feel stuck, you can come up and use the mic too. And oh, next, uh, next time, bring some bring some men with you. Why is it women that are <laughs> the change so, agents? When I was reading this book, I I thought maybe like about having this like in high school or something, or maybe university. So I kept on talking to my mother a lot, saying, you know, it's been great if high school students could read this book because when I was in high school, I didn't learn about the residential school until grade twelve, and then doing becoming a child care provider. I went to a workshop and learned about the 60 scoop and all this. I'm like, I had no clue about any of this stuff. I didn't know anything about the residential schools. I feel like it's time for schools to know about this because I didn't know about this. Well, yeah. And I can tell you this book is being used in high schools, um, in universities. It's been used in uh, Canadian universities, German universities, the John Jay uh, University in New York City. Um, it is being used in schools and that was one of my huge hopes as well. You know, I had these, these wild, vain hopes that I never imagined would actually happen, but it is happening. Um, I even heard of it being used in junior high and I kind of worried about that a little bit because Maisie's story is so explicit and painful. And then I thought, oh my god, ten-year-olds can go on the internet and find worse stuff than that, right? So. So it is being used, and I and I'm glad for that. Um, um, you know, and it's um, um, as once it starts being used that way, people can't say that anymore. They can't say I don't, I didn't know. They can't say it anymore, 
And once you get beyond, um, you know, an articulation of ignorance, once you get beyond that, then you're in a position where you've been confronted with the truth and you have to respond it, respond to it. And if you ignore it, if you ignore it, then that's on you. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yes? I would say, that's coming from a different point of view, but I'll tell you how, um, um, how this ignorance comes about. Um, I come from, as European, a background like grandparents, great-great-grandparents, way back to the 14th century, Scandinavian. Mm -hmm. I went to residential school, which was filled with uh, Scandinavian kids, and we had similar traditions that we had been handed down, things like this. I had heard that there was a residential school in Saskatchewan, Duck Lake, and I thought, well, isn't that nice? I'm having such a blast <laughs> in my residential school. Isn't that nice for them? I'll bet you they're having a great time, too. Mm -hmm. That's how absolutely unknowing and I was at 17. No, that was ages ago, like I'm pretty old. But, you know, it's, it does take a book like yours to say you can't, I mean, I'm being truthful. It was, I was ignorant then, and it was, <coughs> where would I get this information if it wasn't a book like yours, and that wasn't introduced to us, yeah. ever. You know, it's interesting that you say that, because my mom lost her status when she married my dad, mm -hmm. and so we moved away from, from her territory. and. Uh, I didn't know anything about residential schools either. My mother used to talk about, she went to boarding school, yeah. okay. I was an avid reader from, you know, the time I was just really little. So I was reading, you know, age appropriate books and they, you know, like Nancy Drew and boarding schools, what are you gonna hear, something like that. So that was, that was my understanding as like a 10 year old, 11 year old. Um, and then she told me the story, there's only one character in this book that is, that is completely an actual person, and that's Lily, the little girl that dies of tuberculosis. That was the first story that my mother told me when I was 11 about residential schools, about her school, was her watching her friend hemorrhage to death from tuberculosis on the playground. And I think that is why I have dedicated so much of my life to writing about the residential school system is because it shocked me to the core. Yeah. How could anybody do this to little kids? How could anybody do this to my mom? How could my mom survive this? And that, at such a young age, it was just like, like an implant in my brain. But, you know, the other side of that story is um, <clears throat> people, the, the people who have the reins of power, they didn't want anybody to know what was going on. So they told these myths, right? We have to understand it as a myth. There's these lovely schools that, you know, oh, we've, you know, we're, we're helping the poor Indian, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, it, you know, it was, it was an agenda. And, you know, so I, you know, I, give, I cut people slack, right? I, I don't say you should have known. Um, but I do say, now you must. And, um, you know, and it's through these conversations that we can do that, for sure. Yeah, no, I get that. That was just like, that's a stunning moment. Hi, I love, love, loved your book. Congratulations <coughs> on it. Um, and it, it is very, very thought provoking. So as a non-Aboriginal Canadian, what besides having conversations um, would be the best way to move truth and reconciliation forward? I get this question every single time. <laughs> every single time. <laughs> and, you know, I always say, figure it out! <laughs> but uh, not really. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe really. But, um, you know, what I, what I like to do is I like to tell people the story about how the uh, right, how Aboriginal rights were entrenched in the Constitution. They are, and that's not something that was given to us. You know, a bunch of old white guys in Ottawa didn't say, hmm, let's protect Aboriginal rights. Okay, we did that. 
And at the time that the Constitutional Express and the repatriation of the Constitution was going on, was you know in the early 80s okay so not long after the beginning years of the of the novel um virtually everybody that was involved in that and i was too uh were residential school survivors so they had virtually no uh practical education um chief george Manuel, who was the head of the union of ec chiefs at the time um was a key instigator in that movement in setting up the constitutional express and that was the big train that went right across Canada and Indigenous people joined in that train all the way and they went right across the country and they, um, you know, they stormed Capitol Hill and, uh, or Parliament and it was us that did that, okay. So imagine at the time we were 4% of the population, okay. You guys were 96%, not counting you guys, okay. And, uh, um, and we were suffering then so profoundly as we continue to suffer these days from the highest rates of incarceration, the highest rates of addiction, of apprehension of children, of, of violence against women. All of those things that we're now hearing about more were happening then. And we changed the Constitution. <laughs> the Constitution is almost impossible to change. Just ask any Quebecois. Okay, right? You have to have the entire consent of every single provincial government. We did that as a profoundly oppressed people. We did that. So if we could do that, what can non-Indigenous Canada do with all of its privilege? What can it do? It can do anything. And, you know, look at Paris. I just got back from Paris. I like to say that. <laughs> You know, look at Paris. Okay, they're pissed off right now because their president, you know, unilaterally changed the retirement age from 62 to 64. Boo hoo, right? And uh, and you know, they. I was there, and um, you know, the second day I was there was the first day of these national strikes, and the cab drivers, the metro, the train system, everything was just shut down. No garbage collection, no services, nothing. And that was the will of those people to stand up and just say, no, this is, will not do any longer. We could do that here. And I'm all about that kind of direct action. These, these governments are not our governments. They're your governments. Demand, demand that they do what's right, that they recognize indigenous jurisdiction, and that they engage in meaningful negotiation about recognizing jurisdiction, self-determination, about creating resource sharing agreements so that all of the resources that have been taken from our lands without consideration for us, that we start to see some of the financial benefit of that. No more welfare, right? No more state welfare to the oppressed. You know, 1907, I'm going on, 1907, um, Indigenous families were really vocal about the number of children that were dying and ailing in these schools. I don't know, I gotta find another word. You guys send me emails about what I can call them instead of schools. Um, well, something, child jail, something. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, Duncan Campbell Scott, who was the head of the, the Superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time, uh, instructed his chief medical officer, Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce, to do a condition study, a study of the conditions in the residential schools. And so Dr. Bryce, one of my heroes, um, he came back and he said to him, if we had been trying to create a mechanism for the successful transmission of tuberculosis, we've done it with the residential schools. He said the children are dying like flies. They're dropping like flies. We don't even see these rates of death in war. And it's shameful how we are treating our indigenous wards, our Indian wards. Um, Duncan Campbell Scott responded by firing him <laughs> because he continued trying to push an agenda to improve the conditions in the school. And um, so how Scott responded to that was by saying, uh, 
it is readily acknowledged that Indian children lose their natural resistance to illness habituating so closely in the residential schools and that they die at a much higher rate than in their villages. But this alone does not justify a change in the policy of this department, which is geared towards a final solution of our Indian problem. This was in 1918. How many people knew that that term, final solution, generated in Canada, true no strong and free, long before Hitler and the Second World War and the Jewish Holocaust? How many people knew that? Okay. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so again, it's, you know, the question of, um, of the intention of these schools, the real impact of these schools, and the obligation of the ancestors or the descendants of the people who did this, the people that came to this country and employed these measures to destroy us, to stand up and say, oh, that's what you did. This is what you're going to do now. They answer to you. Um, and so I urge direct action. I also urge conversation. You know, and just doing what is possible in your everyday life. You know, there's one woman that wrote me an email and said to me, you know, again that the book had changed her. And she said, I really, she said, I used to walk through the downtown east side in Vancouver, and any of you that might have been there will know that it's basically a village of homeless people, and of course, over representation of Indigenous people in that community. And she said, I used to walk through there and just look away and just, you know, get through there as quickly as I could. And she said, I don't do that anymore. She said, I look at it now. And I engage and I speak with people. And if I can help somebody, I help somebody. So there's that kind of action on that level of just the direct exchange between real living humans. And then there is the, the other more political, active approach to changing the world on the, on the political scale. So um, reconciliation can be individual and personal as well as national and political. And we can all do something, big or small. I know you didn't ask me, but I spent my entire life being an anti-racist educator. And I think racism is, this was a, a form of racism and a, um, a form of bullying. And I think, so anytime you can see that, like we just say we don't, we're not accepting racism. Uh, it has no place in our society and uh, this, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, inadvertent stuff where you're looking away but you're not thinking of that as a, a race, racist action. You have to face up to it and say, why am I doing that? Like what, what makes me think? that those people are not worthy of recognition or that, that they don't matter, that kind of thing. We have to ask ourselves some hard questions. Just to share one short story here is, um, I, I walked into a school board office and uh, I said, what's that over there? And they said, well, that's the newcomer center. And I said, well, what's it for? Well, that's so newcomer parents can come down here and be more engaged in their children's education and they can learn how to speak English better they can look for jobs and use the technology here to get their resumes ready and everything. And then I, I, I felt a, a real pain and I thought, um, am I turning into a racist because I resent this? And I, I just thought to myself, if you had done one of these things for all of the indigenous families that come into the schools that, that are in your jurisdiction, you would be making quite a difference. And so I keep seeing this over and over again and I keep going, I'm not a racist, I'm not a racist. So I have to say to myself, I don't mind the services that newcomers are getting. I just wish that the same consideration was there for indigenous peoples. Somebody else had their hand up. Yeah? Okay. Sure. Hi. Hi. Pleasure to listen to you speak. Um, you said that you were inspired by the parade. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. I rarely have that problem, so. Um, you said that you were inspired by Louise Erdrich and, and her braided narrative, and I love to hear what writers I love are reading and what they're inspired by. So if you have any other like inspirations, I know this is an opportunity to like give us the list. Like who should we read next? You think I have time to read? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, actually, all this. There's a book that's coming out really, really soon um, this year. It's called The Berry Pickers by, oh gosh, I've forgotten her last name, Amanda Peters. She's a, a Mi'kmaq woman, and it's this incredible story. It's like, uh, it's kind of like a crime drama, but the underlying uh, story <coughs> is about stealing children, right? And it is beautifully written. It's not, it has flashbacks, but it's not a braided narrative. But I, I'll say it out loud in public here, she's going to win all the awards this year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Peters. Peters. Yeah, the Barry Pickers. It's a novel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful work. Yeah. yeah. I I got it early. This is the benefit about <laughs> being an author, right, is that publishers will come to you and say, will you write a blurb for this book? And I say, well, maybe. Let me read the book. And uh, so they'll send me, you know, a PDF or an ARC or whatever, and uh, and I'll read it and, and do that. So I get to see what's coming out, which is pretty... Pretty cool, but definitely that would be at the top of my list for everybody. Yeah, yeah it's a good was story. Was there something on the radio uh, about this that the author spoken? I've heard this. Hmm. Very pickers. Well, Which yeah, I'm sure that they're doing some pretty intense promos right now because it's just about to be released, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Is there something wrong with my eyes or that clock's wrong? What time? Uh, the clock's wrong. It, it's just after 8 30, so. <laughs> so, okay. we're, 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 where should we wrap it up? Yes. What are two, I two, one I'm okay, but he's going to say something. Judy? Yeah. 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 Judy, do you want the microphone? No, no you don't need it. <laughs> she could just like laugh. Like, <laughs> what did she <laughs> say? What did she ever needed a microphone? <laughs> you asked, where are the men? Where are the men? Have you not heard that when the women come together and work together, we will heal. Mm -hmm. Maybe these ladies, as life givers, are understanding their role in society as life givers, that we are all going to stand up now and work together. As a settler, I'm very concerned and frightened with our provincial government, what's happening with <laughs> us. And so you should <laughs> So, and, and it frightens me. But I don't know what I can do or how I can best do something. I, I, I'm, I'm just so troubled with this Go action. public. You know, have you ever heard of the Raging Grannies? Yeah. 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 You know, you have to, I mean, we can sit at home and, and worry, right? And I mean, it, you know, this province is selling off crown land mm -hmm. at a rate you cannot even imagine. Yeah. Who knows what crown land is? Okay? Crown, one of the hallmarks of a democracy is that its laws are not meant, are not supposed to be arbitrary. Crown land, the, the concept of crown land, and even reserve land, is uh, the underlying title is in the crown, okay? There was a king in England in the 1100s who woke up one day and thought, all right, I shall proclaim that nobody can own land but the king. That's where that arbitrary pronouncement was where the whole concept of crown land came from. How many people here know what percentage of the Canadian land base is actually privately owned? Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> you must let this child speak eventually, okay? <laughs> yes. I'll tell you. Yes. Do you know? It's 11%. Only 11% of the entire Canadian land base is owned privately. The rest is Crown land, and it is almost 50-50 split between Federal Crown and Provincial Crown. Okay. So, you know, when they're selling off that Crown land, what they're doing is they're selling off our land. Okay, that's ours. Because if you took away that arbitrary, well it was ours anyway, but if you take away, if you, if you overturned that arbitrary law that sits at the foundation of our legal systems, that notion of Crown land wouldn't exist at all. Okay, 
And so, you know, but you know what I, like I say, we can sit and we can worry in our kitchens, you know, or we can talk to our friends and be like, oh my God, what's he gonna do next? Um, or we can make ourselves publicly visible to become visible and that takes a commitment. And so, you know, it takes a, that's all I can say <coughs> is it takes a commitment to actually stand up and do something visible. And you can. Think about the Constitution Express again. Think about us changing the Constitution. You can do that. Um, think about that awesome poem that you read for us about walking up and down the street fundraising for those kids. Okay, you didn't apply for a grant. You took it in your own hands, you stood up, you drew attention to yourself, and you said, let's do this. And it happened. Those kinds of things. It doesn't need to be some grand, huge thing. Um, but it will gain momentum. It will. So, you know, this book is sold almost, we're just this far away from 250,000 copies. Okay. Michelle, so is it okay if I... Uh, I just want to say this. Okay, okay. <laughs> a best-selling book in Canada is... A book in Canada is deter determined as a best-seller if it sells 5,000 copies. Wow. wow. Okay. So, and every book that was sold, I'm sure, has been... Oh, God, I read a good book. Here, read it. Okay. So I would double that number. You know, you heard our librarian friend here say, every book is out. Okay. At one point in Vancouver, the waiting list for the book was over a thousand people. Okay, so it's possible. You just have to commit to it. Do it. Stand up. Be heard. Yeah. Thank you. Because we're talking about personal activism, I want to recognize Tristan DeRocher sitting right here in the green sweater. Uh, those of you that don't know who Tristan is or what he did, he took personal activism to a really great level by walking uh, to the legislature from La Ronge um, and uh, uh, goading our government to do something about the disproportionate and very high rate of suicide across the province, but particularly in the north and particularly amongst the indigenous peoples. And he actually changed what gets to happen on the legislative ground. So congrats. Well, I'm sure you're anxious to spend some money and buy an, another copy of the book because now you know that they're short, there's a shortage of books. You've got to be read. You've got to give one to a friend. Go to the back, buy a book, get it signed, trade your book that isn't signed off, and give it to someone. So, uh, Joe, do you have any closing remarks? Um, just thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, don't leave yet, Kevin. I have something more for you. But no, you're just going to the back. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so uh, as has been said, uh, Helen from uh, McNally Robinson is selling books in the back there. Uh, there's also a table that, uh, <laughs> Michelle, you can go and sit at and sign books at. Um, it is now 8.40. The library closes at 9 o'clock, so we still have 20 minutes. We still have 20 minutes. You got the keys. <laughs> um, so on behalf of Saskatoon Public Library, on behalf of Saskatchewan Library Association, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all.